Greetings, my name is Victoria, and I'm 33 years old. Just the other day after returning from work, I stumbled upon a letter that turned my world upside down. I have always considered myself blessed with a beautiful family, a kind husband and two wonderful children. They were my world, the core of my existence. I never imagined that such a betrayal could come from within our tight-knit circle. My husband Arthur often expressed his love for me, calling me his soulmate and expressing gratitude for having me in his life. He would say, Victoria, you know you're my soulmate. I feel so fortunate every day to have such an incredible wife. You will forever be the love of my life. And I felt the same way about him. I believed we were meant for each other, and I couldn't imagine my life without him. But those were all lies. The truth hit me hard. Arthur's declarations of us being soulmates were nothing but empty words. The realization that your love for someone can disappear the moment they commit an unforgivable act is both shocking and painful. This was my reality, laid bare in the letter I found. The letter revealed Arthur's departure from our lives in the most heart-wrenching way. It read, Victoria, by the time you read this, I'll be gone. I wish there were an easier way to say this. I've fallen in love with someone else. I once believed you were my soulmate, but I've found her, and it's not you. My feelings for her surpass anything we had, and I can't envision a future or a family with anyone else but her. I'm sorry, but I must follow my heart. Please do not try to contact me. My decision is final. I wish you and the children all the best, but I need to be with my true family. How could he do this to us? How do I even begin to explain this to our children? The pain was unbearable, and I found myself crying until there were no tears left. In my despair, I reached out to my mother-in-law, Amy, asking her to pick up the kids from school and keep them for a while. Without questioning me, Amy agreed, her happiness to spend time with the grandchildren masking the turmoil I was feeling. Amy, along with the rest of my in-laws, had always treated me like family. I never anticipated such a betrayal. Lost in a whirlwind of self-blame and confusion, I called Arthur's brother, Walter, and asked him to come over. When he arrived, he was shocked to find me in such distress. What's happened, Victoria? Why are you in tears? Where's Arthur? Please, talk to me, he urged. Between sobs, I managed to say, He's left us, Walter. He's gone. I was utterly lost, clueless about where Arthur could have gone. The daunting task of explaining his absence to our children weighed heavily on me. Oh my goodness, Victoria, what are you saying? You're not making any sense, Walter exclaimed in disbelief. I managed to tell him about the letter Arthur left behind, which I discovered upon returning to a deserted home. Walter read the letter and couldn't help but express his frustration aloud, though he kept his comments to himself. Without a word, he grabbed the phone, intent on confronting Arthur, only to realize that Arthur had already blocked him. After several futile attempts to reach Arthur, including a call to his office, Walter decided it was time to involve our parents. Completely overwhelmed by the situation, I watched as Walter called Amy and Terry, my in-laws, and explained the urgency of the matter. They arrived shortly, having left the kids in the care of a neighbor they trusted deeply. The disbelief and disappointment were palpable as they read Arthur's letter. I can't believe this. What's gotten into Arthur? How could he abandon his family like this? They pondered aloud. Amidst their shock and anger, they tried to offer me solace. Victoria, please don't cry. You've got to stay strong for the children. We'll do everything in our power to make him come back. He must face his responsibilities, especially towards his children, they assured me. Their resolve clear. Terry was especially disheartened, struggling to comprehend how his son could execute such a heartless plan. This is beyond comprehension. I never imagined Arthur could do something like this to you. We all thought he loved you deeply. It's clear now, he's a coward. Rather than confronting us with his feelings, he chose to flee, Terry lamented. It was then revealed that Arthur had resigned from his job months ago without anyone's knowledge, indicating he had been planning his departure for some time. This revelation was a shock to us all. We had spent the past months as if everything was normal, participating in family outings and living our daily lives without a hint of Arthur's true intentions. This is just embarrassing. I'm mortified to call him my son. He will have to face the consequences of abandoning his family, Amy declared, her disappointment in Arthur evident. Despite their anger, 
They also expressed a willingness to accept the situation if Arthur truly loved someone else. If he's found love elsewhere, so be it. But abandoning his children is unforgivable. How do we even begin to explain this to them? The room fell silent, the enormity of the situation settling in. We all knew the conversation with the children would be heartbreaking, yet none of us had the words to soften the blow. The reality that Arthur had left his family behind was a painful truth we were all struggling to accept. Feeling forgotten or unloved by a parent is a deep pain I'm all too familiar with. My father left us after the divorce, saying I was nothing but a reminder of a life he wanted to leave behind. We lost touch completely. This kind of abandonment wasn't new to me. After my mom faced her struggles and couldn't look after me, I ended up navigating the world of foster care alone. The thought of my children feeling this way was unbearable. I vowed to ensure they always felt loved by at least one parent, no matter what. My sons, Billy and Joe, were just nine years old. Despite their young age, they were remarkably perceptive and mature. After some thoughtful discussions with my in-laws, I knew it was time to face the hard truth with my boys. They sensed something was wrong the moment they stepped into the house with Walter. Gathering all my courage, I sat them down for a private conversation. I believe you both sense that something's happened. I started, struggling to find the words. I'm so sorry, my loves. This won't be easy to hear, but your father has left us. We don't know where he's gone, but he's not coming back. Their immediate response was one of disbelief. Dad just left? You can't be serious, Mom. Please say this is some sort of mistake. Why would he do this? What did we do wrong? I reassured them, you've done nothing wrong at all. He made this decision because he believes he needs to be elsewhere. I know it's hard to understand, but we have to accept it. From now on, it's going to be us three. I'm so sorry. If there was anything I could do to change this, I would. The room fell into silence. They exchanged looks, a silent conversation passing between them, and retreated to their room. I knew they were in shock, processing this enormous change, and I respected their need for space. Walter stayed with us that night, offering his support, while my in-laws promised to return the next day to check on us. That day, the boys kept to themselves, a clear sign they were grappling with the news. The silence in the house was a stark reminder of the new reality we were facing, Yet I remained steadfast in my commitment to ensuring my sons felt loved and supported through this unforeseen journey. The worry for my boys weighed heavily on me, sensing their struggle with the situation. Walter, seeing my distress, kindly tried to coax Billy and Joe to join us for dinner, but they declined, saying they had no appetite and preferred to be alone. Throughout this ordeal, Walter's support was immeasurable. He reached out to all of Arthur's friends, inquiring about his whereabouts, only to find out they were equally in the dark and quite upset with Arthur's actions. They promised to keep us updated if any news surfaced. By the next morning, a small glimmer of hope emerged when the kids approached me in the kitchen, enveloping me in a hug. Their words were comforting, yet tinged with hurt. Mom, don't worry. We're here with you. You are enough for us. We don't need to see his face again. We're so angry at him. He doesn't deserve your kindness. We're here for you. If he chooses to live without us, let him. We don't need him anymore. Their words, while supportive, also hinted at their deep-seated pain. He is still your dad, and I know there's love there, I reminded them gently. We do love him, Mom, but it's hard to imagine forgiving him. If we're not important to him, he's better off away from us, they replied. Their maturity and concern for me over their feelings of abandonment by their father were heartening yet heartbreaking. Reflecting on the past, it became clear that Arthur had been distancing himself from us for a while. Despite our conversations and attempts to engage him in family activities, he remained aloof, always excusing himself as being too stressed from work. I had hoped he would eventually reconnect with us, especially with the boys, believing he needed time to sort himself out. Sadly, I was mistaken. As days turned into two weeks with no word from Arthur, who had even gone as far as deactivating his phone, the situation became dire. We eventually reported him missing to the police, but they were at a loss on how to proceed. The idea of hiring a private investigator came up, but the financial burden was too great for us to bear, especially since I was the sole provider for our family. The children held on to a sliver of hope that their father would return, but as months passed without any sign of him, 
that hope slowly faded away. Together with my in-laws, we did our best to fill the void left by Arthur, ensuring the kids felt loved and supported despite the circumstances. The journey was challenging, but the strength and resilience of my family, especially my sons, showed me that even in the face of such adversity, we could find a way to move forward together. To help my children navigate their feelings and ensure they had a space to express themselves without fearing they might upset me, we started therapy sessions. Walter, seeing the toll the situation was taking on me, gently encouraged me to seek therapy as well. Recognizing my own need for support, I agreed. Despite our efforts, understanding and moving past the situation remained a struggle. Eight months later, driven by a need for closure, we renewed our efforts to locate Arthur and learned he had left with a coworker named Judy, someone who had always behaved too familiarly with him. I had previously expressed my concerns to Arthur about Judy's inappropriate behavior towards him, especially after witnessing her actions at a company event. Despite my discomfort, Arthur assured me there was nothing to worry about, claiming Judy was merely seeking guidance in her new job environment. He insisted on his fidelity and love for me, attempting to allay my fears. Unfortunately, my instincts about Judy were correct, but I hadn't imagined Arthur would leave us for her. This betrayal cut deeply, not just emotionally, but practically as well, leaving me unable to pursue a divorce or child support due to Arthur's disappearance. Consulting a lawyer only confirmed my fears. Without an address for Arthur, legal proceedings were impossible. It was evident he had vanished to dodge his responsibilities, particularly financial support for our children, which disgusted me further. Living in the same house became increasingly difficult. It was filled with painful memories, and both the children and I yearned for a fresh start. The kids, especially, expressed a desire to move closer to their grandparents. After much discussion, we decided relocating was in our best interest. The house, owned by my in-laws and earmarked as Arthur's inheritance, had been our home under a rental agreement with them. Moving not only promised a new beginning, but also a chance to leave behind a place that had become a constant reminder of our loss and Arthur's betrayal. Facing financial constraints, we began searching for a more affordable living situation. However, my conversation with my in-laws took an unexpected turn. They shared their thoughts on our situation, acknowledging my desire to leave the house which had become a source of discomfort. I explained to Terry, my father-in-law, that the financial burden of maintaining the house was becoming unsustainable, and I was considering downsizing to a modest three-bedroom apartment. Terry and my mother-in-law proposed an unexpected solution. They offered to give me the house, stating that Arthur had forfeited his right to it through his actions, and they preferred to see it go to me and the grandchildren. I was taken aback and initially insisted I couldn't accept such a generous offer, reminding them that the house was a significant asset and part of Arthur's inheritance. They reassured me that their decision was final, having already updated their will to reflect this change. Despite my protests, they were adamant, expressing their love and support for me as if I were their daughter. In the end, their kindness overwhelmed me, and I was deeply grateful for their unwavering support amidst the turmoil Arthur had caused. With the house now legally mine, I decided to rent it out, using the income to support a fresh start in a new apartment. During this time, Walter became an invaluable source of support for the children and me. As we spent more time together, our friendship deepened into something more. A year after Arthur left, Walter and I discussed our feelings, finding acceptance and support from my in-laws, and even enthusiasm from the kids about the idea of Walter becoming a more permanent fixture in our lives. However, the shadow of my unresolved marriage to Arthur loomed over us, preventing us from fully moving forward. Despite this, we built a life together focusing on the children's well-being and our growing relationship. Three years passed without any sign of Arthur, his absence allowing us to gradually rebuild and find happiness without him. Unfortunately, we faced another challenge when my father-in-law, Terry, passed away. In the wake of his loss, I took on the responsibility of organizing the funeral arrangements, a task made somewhat easier by the absence of Arthur, whom we were unable to contact. Following Terry's passing, the house officially became mine. After discussing it with Amy, Walter, and the kids, we decided to sell it, opting to move closer to Amy and Walter's residence. The real estate market was favorable, and we quickly found a lovely couple interested in the property. This sale not only closed a chapter on a place filled with mixed emotions, 
but also opened a new one, closer to family and filled with hope for the future. After selling the house, we moved into Walter's home. He had inherited it from his father, and it was spacious enough for all of us. Just as we were beginning to feel settled in our new life, an unexpected blast from the past shook everything up. Arthur had returned, utterly bewildered by the changes during his absence. I received a call from an unknown number one day, and to my shock, it was Arthur. He was standing at our old home, confused and questioning me about the new occupants. I was so taken aback that I ended the call abruptly. Arthur, seeking clarity, decided to confront his brother, which led him directly to us. His first questions were about the house, not about his children or how we had been coping without him. His priorities were clear. He was outraged to find strangers living in his house and demanded explanations. When confronted with his lack of interest in his own children, Arthur retorted with news of his new life and impending fatherhood with Judy. He claimed he intended to reclaim the house for his new family. Walter and I explained that the house had legally become mine after his father's will had been updated, leaving Arthur with a small monetary inheritance instead. Furious and disbelieving, Arthur threatened legal action against us, believing he was unjustly robbed of his inheritance. Walter, standing firm, warned Arthur of the futility of his threats and urged him to leave, hinting at legal consequences if he persisted. Arthur stormed off, vowing this wasn't the end. The confrontation left us all distressed, especially considering the children. We decided to break the news to them gently. Their reaction, while upset, was resolute. They didn't want someone who showed such blatant disregard for them in their lives. Shortly after, a legal notice from Arthur's lawyer arrived. Amy, who was aware of the entire situation, expressed her deep disappointment in Arthur and decided to disown him officially, declaring him no longer part of the family. Using the contact information provided by the lawyer's letter, I saw an opportunity to seek justice. I planned to sue Arthur for abandonment, initiate the divorce proceedings, and demand child support. This step was not just about financial reparation, but about holding Arthur accountable for his actions and the impact they had on our lives. It was a moment of reckoning, signaling a new chapter for us, free from the shadows of Arthur's neglect and betrayal. Deciding it was time for Arthur to face the repercussions of his decisions, I was adamant that through the legal pressures we'd apply, he'd have no choice but to acquiesce to the terms of the divorce I proposed. This included charges for child abandonment and neglect. Should he contest the inheritance, I was confident he would not only lose, but also find his finances severely depleted by legal expenses. Walter stood by me, offering unwavering support and assistance in securing a competent attorney. Our goal was clear. Arthur would be held accountable for the turmoil he'd caused me and our children. Post-divorce, we planned to establish a stable and permanent home environment, a stark contrast to the transient and troubled one Arthur had left in his wake. True to his promise, Walter found a skilled lawyer, and I proceeded with the divorce, aiming to secure what was rightfully ours. The children, bravely voicing their experiences, made a profound impact in court, leaving the judge visibly disturbed by Arthur's neglect. Arthur, appearing with his partner, found himself defenseless against the allegations. Additionally, I pursued a lawsuit against his partner for alienation of affection, winning decisively. The court's rulings left Arthur and his partner nearly destitute, their pleas for leniency falling on deaf ears as they faced the financial consequences of their actions. Arthur's attempt to claim his inheritance also failed miserably. Terry had wisely left a portion of the money to Arthur in his will, but his baseless entitlements were dismissed, subjecting him to further ridicule in court. Faced with substantial child support dues, Arthur was compelled to relinquish any funds he had been awarded. After much deliberation, the twins chose to request Arthur relinquish his parental rights, a decision he initially hesitated over but eventually accepted, recognizing their desire to sever ties. This relinquishment absolved him of child support obligations, but I strategically allocated the settlement to establish college funds for the twins. Amidst these legal victories, Walter proposed, marking a joyful commencement to our new life together post-divorce. Arthur's response to our happiness was predictably bitter, but we remained undeterred, attributing the fallout to his actions. His subsequent pleas for financial help, prompted by his deteriorating situation with his partner, were ignored. Ultimately, Arthur and his partner faced the natural outcomes of their choices. In contrast, I embraced a brighter future with Walter, 
who had shown himself to be a far superior partner and father figure than Arthur could ever aspire to be. Our new beginning was not just a departure from the past, but a celebration of renewed hope and unconditional support.